All righty, everybody. I just got the okay to start our planetarium show. So I'm going to put away our space trivia questions and that important message up on the screen because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> and uh, once again, everybody, welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter. And just a heads up, I'm not just a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person and I'm standing right behind you. Hey, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> Don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. I just want to let you know that I'm here. I'm going to be your uh, space pilot, in a sense. And uh, everything that you see in purple in our dome is going to be one enormous screen, thanks to the help of six different projectors hiding throughout our planetarium dome. If you're looking for those projectors, we got two at the very bottom, two in the middle, and two at the very top, just below the purple glow. But just also to let you know, the show that we're about to do right now is different from all the other previous planetarium shows that we've done here today in the planetarium, uh, because this one's called Tour of the Universe. And with Tour of the Universe, um, this one's completely live, so you're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes. And what this one's about, we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth, and we're going to be zooming all the way out to the very edge of the known universe. Hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are in space. But just a heads up, we are very, very small in the grand scheme of things, so just want to warn you beforehand. And uh, before we get started, I do got to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We're going to have a good experience in the planetarium. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside. If you manage to bring any snacks or beverages, make sure those are tucked away to the very end of the show. We want to keep the theater nice and clean. Also, uh, this does include no feetsies on the seatsies because, again, we want to make sure the seats stay nice and clean. Uh, we do appreciate your help, folks. And also, if you happen to have any 21st century gadgets like cell phones, smartwatches, tablets, anything that produces bright white light, now is the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, put them away for the next 30 minutes, as those can be very distracting in a very dark environment like our planetarium, because it not only distracts you, it distracts the people sitting behind you. So we do appreciate your help once again. And also, folks, uh, just a reminder, uh, please wear your mask above your nose at all times while we're in the planetarium dome. People tend to forget that we breathe out of our nostrils, so make sure those nostrils are covered up. Uh, looks like we got about ooh, 35 people here in the planetarium dome. We're going to be here for 30 minutes, so again, we do appreciate your help. And folks, if you do need to leave uh, early during our presentation, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, all we ask is that you exit at the very top of the planetarium. That's where the exits are going to be before, during, and after the show. And uh, last but not least, before we get started, uh, our show is quite immersive thanks to our enormous 70-foot dome. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, you may even feel a little bit scared. Don't worry. That's totally normal. Sometimes I feel scared too. Uh, there's a really quick and easy way to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, and your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling through space, at least not more than the usual. Hee, hee, hee. But with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go. Y'all ready for a planetarium show? Yeehaw! All righty, everybody, let's get started with our tour of the universe. All righty, everybody. As I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to home. We can see uh, the Earth just down below. Looks like we're hovering off the coast of California. I can see Baja, California, the Central Valley down below. But we're going to be starting off much, much closer to this object right in front of us. What we're looking at is the International Space Station, or the ISS for short. And a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, what's the International Space Station? I always hear about it on the news, uh, maybe on some articles. But what exactly is it? Well, folks, the International Space Station is a pretty much a collaboration between many nations across planet Earth, and they want to pretty much figure out what happens to things in space. So the International Space Station is a research facility that's orbiting around our planet Earth. And uh, they conduct all sorts of experiments up here, uh, chock full of them. Um, some of my favorite ones are some experiments like what happens when you try to grow plants in space? Do the plants grow the same? Do they uh, grow differently with a less gravitational environment? Uh, what happens when you try to spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does it act differently? And then there was one of my other favorites is uh, they had two identical twins. Uh, one twin lived on Earth and the other one lived on the International Space Station for a year. And after that experiment, they compared and contrasted. Turns out the, the twin that lived on the International Space Station for a year, uh, there wasn't that much of a difference. The only thing that they noticed was that the one in space aged a little bit slower, and uh, that person also lost a lot of body mass index because they don't have gravity constantly working on their muscles. 
So uh, if you're planning to visit space for a long period of time, make sure to exercise every day. Hee hee hee. And uh, just to let you know, folks, uh, the International Space Station looks enormous on our screen right now, but it's not too big. Um, the International Space Station is only about the size, the size of an American football field. So if you've never been to an American football game, don't worry. Uh, we can also use the whole California Academy of Sciences as a great reference as well. That's how big the International Space Station is. And also, the International Space Station isn't too far away from our planet Earth either. Uh, it's only about 225 miles above the surface of our Earth. So 225 miles, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend. Hee <laughs> hee. And also, folks, uh, the International Space Station is going incredibly fast. It's going to whop in 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbit, orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. <laughs> And uh, also to let you know, folks, this is as far as we put humans into space nowadays because traveling into space gets quite costly. Uh, first, you got to get your hands on a rocket ship or build yourself a rocket ship. And then you got to get your hands on a whole lot of rocket fuel. And I mean a whole lot of it. And once you get your hands on all that rocket fuel, you also have to account for all the food, the water, all the air you're going to be breathing while you're up here in space. So the bill gets quite costly quite rapidly. But this is just our first stop on our tour of the universe, so let's leave the International Space Station behind. And we're now going to see it slowly disappear compared to our planet Earth. We'll probably lose it to the Pacific Ocean. And before we lose track of the International Space Station, I want to add a nice orbital path so we can uh, keep track of it. So there's our nice little orbital path, and let's zoom on out. And uh, folks, as we're zooming on out, I do want to let you know that the space program that I'm using here in the Planetarium Dome is something that you can go home and download and fly, use yourself. Uh, the space program that I'm using here is something called Open Space Project. So if you type in your favorite, uh, go to your favorite search engine, type in Open Space Project, you can fly through space just like how I am. But just a heads up, Open Space isn't entirely finished. It's in its beta phase. Uh, so we may experience a few glitches or bugs here and there. In fact, I can see a nice little bug right at the poles of our planet. Uh, we have some data missing there, but that's okay. Uh, we can look past that. <laughs> and also just to mention, uh, open space uses a whole lot of processing, processing power and information. So I wouldn't recommend downloading this if you have an older computer. Maybe if you have a newer one or a gaming computer with a lot of processing power, give it a try. It's a whole lot of fun. But if you're a person like me that doesn't want to download anything but still wants to fly through space, there's also another great alternative called NASA's Eyes. So kind of like the human eyeball, just type in NASA's Eyes. And uh, there you just go to a website and you get to fly through space just like how, how I am right now, which is a whole lot of fun. So we got Open Space Project for one, and then the other one is NASA's Eyes. But let's leave our planet Earth behind because now we're going to be making our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. And just to let you know, folks, we humans have been to the moon before, but it was quite a while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions. That brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon, conduct science, and of course, they had some fun as well. They got to play some golf. But uh, it looks like a majority of our moon is covered in shadow, so luckily we are inside a planetarium. We have some special abilities, so let me turn off the night time on the moon. And there is a moon. That looks much more familiar. Good to see you. But again, folks, we sent humans to the moon. Uh, that was, again, last time, 1972, so a little more than 50 years ago or so. But don't worry, NASA has a new space, space mission in the works that's going to be sending humans to the moon in the next few years. This new space mission is called Artemis, which is pretty funny to say because Artemis is the sister to Apollo in Greek mythology. NASA's very clever at coming up with these space names. But uh, what's the whole purpose of Artemis? Well, NASA wants to send humans to Mars, but before we send humans deep into our solar system, we got to figure out exactly how we're going to live out here in space. So the moon is a perfect stepping stone to figure out all those logistics, how exactly we humans are going to live out here in space. And uh, what's also really cool about Artemis is that not only are we going back to the moon, uh, they're also going to be sending the first woman to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be setting up lunar bases all around the moon. 
pretty much we want to learn more about the moon aside from all those samples that we took about 50 years ago or so. So uh, with Artemis, they might set up a lunar base right over here by uh, this crater. Maybe they want to check out that crater. Maybe they want to look at the um, the highlands of the moon. Maybe they'll set up a base right over here. Or maybe they want to go check out some older lava tubes uh, that they didn't really get to get a look at too much. So maybe they'll set up a lunar base somewhere over there. But what's also really neat is that with Artemis, they're also going to have a space station that's orbiting around the moon at all times. This space station is going to be called Lunar Gateway. Kind of just like how we saw with uh, the International Space Station, this space station is going to be orbiting around. So if anything was to go wrong while the astronauts are on the surface of the moon, those astronauts can launch off the surface and then head to that space station where they would be safe. So again, uh, we humans should be back on the moon in the next few years, crossing my fingers. So hopefully everything goes according to plan. But look out for any news about Artemis in the coming years, y'all. And folks, uh, when we humans look up at the moon here on Earth, the moon sometimes feels incredibly close to us, especially when it's close to the horizon. Sometimes it feels so close you can reach out your arms and touch it. But the moon is incredibly far away from us. The moon's roughly about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Whew, 240,000 miles. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop, going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it, the roads out here are poorly maintained. <laughs> and uh, from here on out, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement of light speed. Now, light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 30,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, folks, it's time for us to leave the moon. So everybody, everybody say bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. And now, folks, we're now going to be stepping into a much larger realm of our solar system because now we're going to see the moon and their orbits as they slowly recede. In fact, let me turn on all those planet trails so we don't lose track of the moon. You can easily lose stuff in space. There we go. And on our journey, folks, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination thanks to help of computer models like Open Space showing us the most accurate and information available to us. And uh, now the nearest star to us, the sun, should be coming into view any second. Here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. And just to let you know, folks, the sun is incredibly far away from us. It's roughly about 93 million miles away from the Earth. Whew, 93 million miles away, that is quite far. But in terms of light speed, that's not far at all. So we're the third rock from the sun right over here. The sun's right there. 93 million miles between us two. And, uh, for light to travel up, to get it all the way over to Earth, it takes light only about eight and a half minutes at that speed of light. Now, that's a really cool concept to keep in mind because let's say the sun was to turn off all of a sudden, it's no longer emitting light. That last bit of sunlight will travel that 93 million miles, travel that eight and a half minutes at the speed of light, and then all of a sudden it would reach Earth, and then suddenly the daytime would become nighttime. Now, that's also a really cool concept to keep in mind because that also works for really far away objects in space as well. For example, let's say we're looking at a star in the background that's, uh, let's say, this one 70 years away from us, 70 light years away from us. Well, we're looking at that star as it looked like 70 years ago because that light that just reached us traveled 70 years to get to us. So when we're looking back at really further away objects in space, it's kind of like looking back in time in a sense. Pretty cool. But now that we have a nice bird's eye perspective of our solar system, let's name all the objects uh, in our solar system. There's quite a few of them. So right in the middle, we have our sun. And then the closest planet to the sun, we've got Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth. That's us. That's where we live. And then we got Mars. These are all the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places where we can land a spacecraft on. And then past the orbit of Mars, we have this really cool thing called the main asteroid belt. And this is what it would look like if we were to highlight all those asteroids in the asteroid belt. There is quite a few of them. There they are. And uh, one of my favorite things is that the asteroid belt was discovered in the early 1800s by a European organization that called themselves the Celestial Police, which kind of sounds like something out of Doctor Who, in my opinion. <laughs> 
And then past the main asteroid belt, we have the really big planets. We have our gas giants. We've got uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And then past those, we have our icy gas giants. We've got Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And of course, of course, we can always add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. So here's the orbit of Pluto coming up on screen. There it is right on the top. And a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, why did Pluto get kicked out of the Planet Club? I love Pluto. I learned about Pluto as a planet in school. Uh, Viva la Pluto. Well, you see, folks, Pluto hangs out here in this outer part of our solar system uh, past the region of, the, of Neptune uh, called the Kuiper Belt. And you're probably wondering, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, the Kuiper Belt's going to be all of this stuff. Give it a second. There it is. So again, this is the Kuiper Belt, and you can think of it as a second asteroid belt way out here in the outer parts of our solar system. And in 2006, astronomers found more than 400 objects out here in the Kuiper Belt region, and they were very worried because they were like, ooh, do we call all of these things planets? So all the astronomers across planet Earth had a great big meeting. They had to figure out what exactly you need to be to be considered a planet. And one of the criteria is that you need to be so big and so massive that you push all the other stuff out of your orbital path. Unfortunately for Pluto, it didn't pass that criteria. Uh, Pluto orbits its own moon, Charon, so it's not clearing its path, which is why Pluto is now considered a dwarf planet. But don't worry, there's quite a few dwarf planets out here in the Kuiper Belt region. We've got Make, Make, Haumea, Aries, and of course, closer to our main asteroid belt, we've got Ceres right over there. But I want to put away the Kuiper Belt because that's just a whole lot to look at. And now, folks, I'm going to be adding on screen some of the different spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. So here come the trajectories. On screen, we have uh, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2. And the latest of them all, we have New Horizons, which we can see a nice little interaction with Pluto in 2015 right over here. And just to let you know, all of these spacecrafts are traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not yet traveled as far as light travels in a single day. In order for light to travel all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, it takes light about nine hours at the speed of light to get all the way out here. So nine hours, so a good chunk of time. But let's leave our planetary system behind because now we're going to be heading into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over about four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. And let me just make sure my calculations are correct. Ah, uh, yes, so Alpha Centauri is going to be right over here on the left-hand side of our screen. You can see that star closest to us moving. We're right over here, so again, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us. But that doesn't really put into perspective of how long it would take us to travel in a rocket to get to the next star system. Well, if we were to get in a rocket today, launched off and headed over to the next star system, it's going to take you about 8,500 years to cross that distance. Whew, and that's just a one-way trip. But folks, let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. All right, so now we are inside the radio sphere, and the radio sphere represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions, emitting out from the Earth. And this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, uh, early television, radar signal, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they travel at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, of course, the radio sphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year, so is anybody out there listening? And right now, folks, I'm going to be adding some markers onto the screen. These markers indicate some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has at least one or more planet orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far today, we found a close to approaching about 5,000 exoplanets just in the nearby vicinity to us. Whew, 5,000 exoplanets. Oh, 
What's really great is that we have space telescopes where their whole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible so that 5,000 is going to be constantly increasing as they continue to scan the night sky. You can see right over here on the left hand of our screen that we pointed our space telescopes in one direction and they found a whole heap of exoplanets just in that one direction. So uh, that 5,000 is definitely going to be growing in the future. But to say if any of them are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it, well, that's hard to say right now. Uh, we don't have the technology or the spacecrafts, the telescopes that are dedicated for that. Pretty much they're being developed right now, so it's going to be a few years before we can answer that question. But uh, just to let you know, folks, the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in this star system over here on the left-hand side. We find an alien civilization all the way on the right side. Let's say this one over here. We shoot them a text message, take 60 years to get to them. Hi. Uh, they listen in, answer back um, another 60 years to get that message. That is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew, and I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. <laughs> but of course, folks, planetary systems beyond the radiosphere, more than 90 light years away, have not heard from us yet. But eventually they will, as the radiosphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. And for now, I'm going to be putting away our exoplanet markers because there's a whole lot of them on screen. But I want to leave our radio sphere up on our screen because as huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. So keep your eyes on that radio sphere as we continue zooming out. All righty. Can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> just kidding and uh, again folks we are now looking down on our milky way galaxy and our milky way galaxy is incredibly large if you wanted to cross our galaxy from one side to the other it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light that is enormous but what's also really neat is that our milky way galaxy is so huge we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone if our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I do want to sh uh, stress the shape of it. When we look at it from a sideways perspective, you're going to notice that we live in a flat spiral disk of the Milky Way. So here comes that viewpoint. There we go. Now, this is going to come important later on the show because when astronomers and scientists want to learn about the universe, it's so much more convenient for them to point their telescopes and equipment galactically north and galactically south. Instead of looking through the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, which has uh, planets, stars, gas, debris, nebula, asteroids, whew, a whole bunch of things. So again, keep that in mind. We like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south. But folks, the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So in this giant leap, we're now going to see a view where each point of light no longer represents a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy, each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small, also includes the near, nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda galaxy only 2 million light years away, just next door, and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And folks, as we continue zooming out, we're now looking at a picture, and you're going to notice that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they like to avoid each other where there's very few galaxies, or a voids where there's no galaxies at all. We can see a nice galaxy cluster right over here in the middle. We can see a nice galaxy cluster a little bit towards the top. We can see um, very few galaxies on the left-hand side of our screen or some voids. So you can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together or they like to avoid each other. And folks, we've zoomed so far back out now that the picture that we're looking at represents the closest 30,000 galaxies to us in space over 300 million light years across. We've got to give thanks to a very... Uh, Pretty amazing, a fellow by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, 
who worked at the University of Hawaii, who compiled this amazing representation thanks to the work of dozens of other astronomers working beside him over decades of time. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tully. I love flying through this galactic map. But folks, now we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So now we're about to see the large scale structure of the universe. And remember folks, every single point of light that you're seeing is not a star, that's an individual galaxy. Whew, I feel small. And uh, just a heads up, the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. Remember when I just mentioned that we live in a flat spiral disk of our Milky Way galaxy? Well, if we were to line up our Milky Way disk, it would line up just like so. So again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of our Milky Way. But astronomers still want to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane of our Milky Way. So you can see this nice purple surveys of galaxy. You'll notice that we didn't find as many or as far. Pretty much we had to wait for technology to advance before we can uh, fill in all these gaps that haven't been mapped out yet. So it's just a matter of waiting for that technology to be developed. So it should be, uh, whew, I don't know, a little while before we can map out all this stuff. But folks, just a heads up, it looks like we're running drastically low on time. So we need to continue pressing on. 30 minutes is just not enough time to talk about the universe. <laughs> but now, folks, we're about to uh, come across these objects way out here in the very edge of the large-scale structure of the universe. These orange objects right over here, these are called the quasars. So we can see quasars on the top over there. We can see quasars on the bottom as well. And quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we're about to see the very edge of the observable universe. All righty, folks, we are at the very edge of the observable universe. What we're looking at is something known as the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. Now, all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is a very baby version of the universe. Only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And uh, what we're looking at is not a typical photo either. Instead, what we're looking at is a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color coded with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions and those darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. But these fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, uh, they gave rise to a large scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us to go, so we only have one direction left to go. That's going to be back home. So let's find a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies. And let's make our return trip back to planet Earth. And folks, we are crossing an expanse of over 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. And we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I wanna remind everyone that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars make for a very decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. 
Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But it looks like we're now entering our Milky Way galaxy. We're heading straight for that radio sphere. And of course, we are making our way downtown, walking fast faces, passing our homebound. Da -na 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 -na. And we are now making our way back to our own star system, our solar system, passing those spacecrafts we sent out in the 1970s to explore the solar system, passing the Kuiper Belt. And of course, we're passing the main asteroid belt, making our way to the third rock from the sun, our home world, planet Earth, the only place we humans have ever called home. And it looks like we're about to pass the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into space. Whew. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. And I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching it with me today. I hope you did enjoy it. But with that being said, that's all for now. And uh, thank you for stopping by, everyone. Take care.